Are you looking for a mid-sized, premium, high-performance electric SUV? One that hopefully doesn't cost a hundred grand. Well, in that case, forget about the Audi Q8 e-tron, BMW iX, Mercedes-Benz EQS, SUV, Tesla Model X or Volvo EX90, and it looks like you're left with... Um, Voya. Voya Free. Voya Free is a premium SUV manufactured by China's Dongfeng conglomerate. The Voya brand is relatively new as it debuted in autumn 2020 during the Beijing Auto Show when many people were more concerned about the upcoming second COVID lockdown. At 490cm in length and 195cm in width, the Voya Free is slightly smaller than the Audi Q8 e-tron and the BMW iX, but it is larger than the Mercedes-Benz EQE SUV. And compared to its European rivals, Voya Free design is quite understated. Dominating the front is a wide radiator grille and it's no accident as the Free also comes in plug-in hybrid form in some markets. There is a thin LED strip between the headlights and in the middle is a glowing brand logo, a large letter V. This is also a reference to the Kunpeng, a Chinese mythological creature, a fish that transforms into a mighty bird. This is meant to symbolize freedom. From the side you can see how long the bonnet is in relation to the rest of the car. Clearly Voya wants space for the internal combustion engine in a plug-in hybrid. The Mazda CX-60 looks similar from the side, but Mazda features a 3.0-liter inline-6, while Voya Free PHEV has just a 4-pot 1.5-liter unit. But that doesn't apply here, as in Europe we only get the EV version. A glowing strip runs across the entire width of the rear as well, that's the main rear lighting because those arrows are turn signals. In the middle is the word Voya, and in the lower right corner is the word Free. Does the font remind you of the one used by Mercedes on the EQE models? Under this long bonnet is the frunk. Now, it opens like in a BMW, so you have to pull the release lever twice, but it's very deep, tucked away down there, so it's hard to reach. Now, the frunk has 72 liters capacity and it is square shaped, so I couldn't fit a cabin size suitcase in there, which is about 50 liters in volume. But at least there is somewhere to store your charging cable if the AC outlet you want to use requires that you bring your own. While charging, I encountered the first problem, or rather, two problems. Under normal circumstances, you open the charging flap from the infotainment menu, Ah, this could have been a physical button, uh, we'll talk about that later. In this example, the flap is misaligned, so you have to use some leverage. Ah, there you go. And I'm sure this is a problem with this one unit and the service will fix it. Now, secondly, unplugging the charging cable is different in Voya than in every other EV I reviewed so far. Usually, you have to press the unlock button on the remote control twice and the second press stops charging and releases the plug or there is a release button next to the port. Simple and logical, but not according to the Voya software developers. According to the information I received from the Polish distributor, the plug will be released only when the battery is fully charged or when the maximum charge level set in the menu is reached. So, for example, we charge only to 80%. In other words, it's going to be released when the charging is complete according to the car's computer. But what if I need to leave now? I've tried double-clicking the remote control multiple times, holding down the unlock button longer that opens the windows. I aborted charging from the onboard computer. I clicked the open charging flap button in the menu. Nothing. I tried to deduce something from the manual what the English translation leaves much to be desired. The distributor suggested an emergency release in the boot and only then I was able to free the plug from the car. While filming cutaways, the release string broke, so 
the next step was the emergency button on the wall box and that kind of solved the problem. Again, maybe it's an issue with this test unit or maybe it's all of them. Check it out during your test drive. While we're around the boot, it can be opened with a gesture, a remote control, or a button on the rear window wiper. This looks like it was taken from the Porsche Macan or Cayenne. At 560 liters, the boot is larger than in the BMW iX and the Mercedes EQE SUV. There are two shopping bag hooks, a 12 volt outlet, anchor points by the floor for securing luggage, and a cargo cover. There is no storage space under the floor, so there is nowhere to stow the cover. With the rear seat backrest folded, there is a flat loading area. Doors cover the sills, which is a good thing, and uh, there is plenty of legroom and headroom in the back. There are door pockets and there are pockets in the backs of the front seats. You can put it here. There is an armrest with some cup holders, but no ski hatch. There are vents, air vents, but no third zone climate control, not at least not in this trim. And uh, there are two USB ports down here by the floor, which is not a very good idea because when there are cables sticking out of there, the third passenger is very likely to kick those cables around. At first glance, the cockpit may resemble that of a Mercedes with three screens across the entire width of the dashboard. Also, the window switches look like they're from a Mercedes. Turn signals and wiper stocks, on the other hand, seem to be from the Porsche Taycan. The upholstery feels soft and premium, and the interior very much looks and feels Mercedes-like, at least initially. Not everything is perfect. For example, most of the vehicle's settings and functions are controlled from the center display, and the menu logic leaves much to be desired. For example, driver's seat memory settings are accessed from the driver's seat heating and ventilation menu. And sure, you can pull up shortcuts, but what's wrong with buttons on the doors or on the seat? The display is a touchscreen, but drive modes are actually controlled with a button on the center console, even though you'd think that pressing one of these would change something, but no. So you have to click through all of them to get to the one you actually want. Hmm. Now, this car has adaptive suspension, believe it or not, but um, you have to access it through the, through the uh, on-screen menu instead of a button, for example. Couldn't the suspension be controlled with a physical button? Instead of wasting this precious space for a button to raise and lower the dashboard, which is also linked to the sport mode and uh, as far as I can tell is pretty much pointless. On the plus side, there is a button on the center console to activate the 360 cameras and parking assist system. And on the steering wheel are buttons to save dashcam pictures and to activate the night vision system. Unfortunately, the night vision camera has a narrow field of view and the pedestrian or animal detection system works kind of too late. So it's practically useless because I assume we drive with headlights on. Android Auto or Apple CarPlay? Nope. The Polish distributor says they will provide the customers with a workaround, but this hasn't been implemented on this test car yet. I never understood the concept of another display in front of the passenger. In a Ferrari or a Porsche, for example, some performance data is displayed for the passenger, so perhaps it's to scare them. Here, it's like in a Mercedes. The passenger can watch a video or control the infotainment. I guess it's better than minimizing navigation screen for the driver. Still, a bit of a gimmick. On a positive note, there are physical buttons to operate air conditioning. A negative is that the home button is actually on the display, on the touch display. I like this um, rear child camera option. This could be solved with a panoramic mirror, but a panoramic mirror won't take pictures of your adorable offspring, which you can then copy to a USB drive. You can also take pictures of yourself, so you and your entire family have fond memories of when you're stuck in traffic. 
at the bottom of the center console is a wireless charger. Note, this car has so much power, your phone will fly out of there when you give your Voya the beans. Next is a trackpad, which is used to change radio stations and volume control. What's wrong with a volume knob and two buttons? They take up less space than a trackpad, which does nothing else. The cup holders are okay. There is a sizable storage compartment under the armrest. The glove box is average size. The door pockets are deep but shaped so that my water bottle doesn't stay in one position. I guess I need a bigger water bottle. The start button also looks like it's from a Mercedes. After the first few hundred meters behind the wheel of the Voya 3, I had mixed feelings. I don't know where Dongfeng sources components for its cars, but on small bumps the adaptive suspension behaves a bit like the Mercedes Airmatic a decade ago. Instead of quiet and comfortable ride, there is some jittering and the intensity of the jittering depends on the speed and how rough the road is, but it's especially noticeable at low speeds such as when you're driving through a residential area. Driving around town is okay, but I suggest turning off the rear-end collision warning system. Often, when a car approaches you from the back at the traffic light, Voya's turn signals will start blinking rapidly, and that's how the system works, but just turn the thing off. Other driver aids are less intrusive. Outside the city, it's a good idea to turn off lane departure warning. The Voya 3 is a wide SUV, so on narrow roads, it's common to cross the line, especially when avoiding potholes. On the other hand, the lane keeping assist is better than I expected, but not perfect. For example, when driving on a motorway, the adaptive cruise control slows down on gentle curves because it's unsure of the road situation ahead. The visualization of the road situation on the driver's display also shows that the car doesn't know what's going on. And on top of that, every lane change ends with a chime that the lane assist system is back on again. I'd be happy with a chime when it gets lost. On motorways from about 120 km per hour, wind noise becomes noticeable. The faster you go, the worse it gets. Uh, it's as if I were driving a G-Wagon, not a modern aerodynamic electric SUV. Speed limits appear only on navigation screens, in front of the driver or on the central display. By the way, the graphics on the driver display are terrible. I think these are supposed to be like 3D tunnel gauges. Fortunately, you can change the display skins. This feature is marked with what looks like a t-shirt. This car is full of surprises. Performance is also surprising at 489 horsepower and range of up to 500 kilometers. This SUV weighs 2340 kilograms, a result comparable to Tesla Model X as German competitors weigh more. And it accelerates from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 4.4 seconds. I checked and in sport mode, I managed just under 4.5 seconds. No preconditioning of the battery, no maintaining a specific charge level like at a Volkswagen, just sport mode and boot it. It was a chilly morning. Uh, and the asphalt was a bit frosty, the car danced probably till about 80 km per hour, so I suspect on a dry road I would have achieved a better result than the factory 4.4 seconds. Now the power, power delivery in normal and sport mode is quite aggressive, so be gentle with the throttle. Apart from low-speed ride and high-speed noise issues I mentioned, the car is pleasant to drive, uh, though it feels large. Rear-wheel steering, even as an option, I'd pay for it. Since this is an all-wheel drive car, here's my non-scientific diagonal approach test, where I stop in the middle and try to get going again with limited traction on two wheels on the diagonal. The first attempt is in normal mode, and the car gets up just fine. The next two attempts are in off-road mode, which is called outing here. 
and snow mode. Pedal to the metal and the car doesn't know what to do. Finally, for shits and giggles, normal mode with ESP off. This is what it's like when the computer doesn't know what's going on. At least power consumption is decent. I got into the Voya 3 from a low-spec MG4 without a heat pump. That was using 26, 27 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. Voya does 25, 26 kilowatt hours on the same routes, no problem. Of course, above 110 kilometers per hour, consumption increases, but up to 90 kilometers per hour, I managed to get below 21 kilowatt hours. Beside the individual mode, there are no recuperation settings. In normal mode, recuperation is weak, and in eco mode, recuperation is stronger. So I drove mostly in eco mode. After restarting, the car remains in the previously selected mode. During my few days with the Voya 3, daytime temperature was around 6-7 degrees Celsius. On warmer days, I think factory spec 18.3 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers is achievable, as long as you don't tow up to 2 tons, which this SUV can handle. Charging. 11 kilowatts AC, up to 120 kilowatts DC, Fast charging takes about 45 minutes from 20 to 80% state of charge, so not brilliant. The traction battery has 106 kWh gross or 110 kWh net capacity. There's an 8 year or 160,000 km warranty on the traction battery and 5 years or 100,000 km warranty on the car. At the time of writing the script, one of Polish dealer groups is considering whether or not to become the Voya distributor around here. As far as I know, there is a Swiss distributor for Western Europe, and at 75,000 euro for an almost 500 horsepower EV, the Voya 3 is competitively priced, albeit not free. This kind of money gets you a Kia EV9, which some say is too expensive for a Kia, which isn't exactly premium. Are the Chinese premium brands too expensive or worth it? What do you think? Let me know in the comment section below. If you like my sarcastic, down-to-earth and possibly mildly amusing car reviews, join me every Friday at 3 p.m. Central European time and don't forget to subscribe and like this video as it helps me with the YouTube algorithm. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.